Okay, well today what we want to do is we want to continue talking about supply and demand and that model and how it works, some applications. If you'll remember last time what we talked about was uh, what causes the demand curve to shift. Let me sort of go back and mention. If you remember, the position, the shape and position of the supply and demand curve uh, determines the equilibrium price and quantity in the marketplace. And what we said was, is that that equilibrium price and quantity will continue to be observed, or to, uh, will prevail forever unless these curves shift. But uh, that's where the action is in the markets. Last time what we talked about was what would cause the demand curve to shift, let's say from D1 to D2 or to D3. If you remember, a rightward shift in demand is an increase in demand, and a leftward shift in the demand curve is a decrease in demand. So last time we talked about a few of the things, the major things, that will cause the demand curve to shift. Okay? What we're going to talk about today, and I think we just got a little start on it last time, was the, is factors that will cause the supply curve to shift either to the right or to the left. A kind of an ugly looking graph with all these curves in there, but, but basically that's what we're working our way through right now is just talking about factors that shift the supply curve. And if you remember, what we do is we uh, reserve that term, the shift in supply or shift in demand, change in supply, change in demand, we use that term to discuss or to describe a movement of the curve as opposed to a movement along the curve from one point to another, and that can only be caused by a change in price. Okay, so anyway, what causes a supply curve to shift? One, a change in the number of firms. Or let's say a number of suppliers in the market. The more suppliers there are in the marketplace, the greater the supply will be. And the greater the supply, I mean the, the supply curve will shift to the right. Let me see if I can't draw this real quickly here. So if we have a supply curve S1, when at some price, let's say the price is P1, Mm, the quantity Q1 is being offered for sale. Maybe we have, I don't know ex the example I gave last time, maybe there are 25 firms in the industry to begin with. And now if there's the entry of one more firm, we have 26 firms, what happens is that that supply curve will shift to the right. S2 with 26 firms. We get a greater quantity being offered for sale Q2 now, even though the price has not changed at all. A rightward shift in supply, a greater supply. And of course, if one of the firms left the industry and we only had 24 remaining, this supply curve would shift to the left. Okay. And so then what we would observe is a smaller quantity being offered for sale, even at that same old price of P1. A, a second thing will shift the supply curve is the change in technology. Now, to give you an example of a change in technology, I think everybody's sort of familiar with technology. Technology, let me just sort of give you a quick definition. Technology is really Mm, it's a knowledge thing. It's our, our knowledge of how to use resources, how to combine resources, and so forth. And better technology means we can bring those resources together in a different sort of mix or application and um, get a greater level of output. Now, uh, there's a lot of different examples of technology. Let's take a simple one, though. Let's say that um, your business is digging ditches. And you can dig a ditch with, of course, a shovel, or you can dig a ditch with a backhoe, one of these big tractor things with a claw on it that will pick dirt up and so forth. 
what happens was, or is that if you have a worker, and that worker is out there with a shovel using very little capital, that worker is not very productive. If we take natural resources again, but steel and rubber and so forth, things that we get from nature, and combine those into a certain combination, we get a tractor with a backhoe, one of these shovels on it. And so the improvement in technology means that that one worker can now dig a lot more in the same amount of time than previously. Or it might be that we're talking about, oh gosh, what, uh, telephone calls. And in the um, old days, uh, and by old days, I mean a few years back, what would happen was you'd have people at either end, let me sort of get these people with their stick legs and arms and so forth, uh, and they want to talk to each other. And what we had back in the old days is we had a wire running from one point to another. And that's a certain technology. And then as time went by, we shifted over, stopped using those, the lines, just running from one telephone pole to the next. And they started, let me, let's put these uh, lines in the air, on the poles, let's say on poles. And the next technology that came along was they put these on cables underground. Now these lines that were you know, sort of running from pole to pole, they would carry just a few telephone conversations at any one point in time. But that was okay because there weren't a lot of people. There were a lot of people with phones, but not everybody had telephones. And the ones who did have telephones, very often they wouldn't call anybody long distance. And so the number of these lines going from town to town, um, even though there was just a limited number, that was okay. Usually you could get through. Usually you didn't get a busy signal. Then over, as time went by, and this would have been like in the mid-1960s, the telephone company started putting these cables underground. The cable would be, I don't know, four inches across, and it would have these uh, uh, wires running through it. And each one of those wires was capable of carrying several telephone conversations at once. And that being the case, the entire cable could carry a few thousand telephone conversations. And then the next thing is they put these on microwave towers. Uh, oh yes, I'm quite an artist, you know. Got a little bit of a curvature to that one to make sure it gets to the right spot. These towers would send out those signals, though, um, and, and the towers, I don't know exactly the distance, but they could shoot this signal roughly, let's say, 30 miles. And then as soon as it was caught at the next tower, uh, they'd turn around and beam it on to the next one, another 30 miles or so away. But these telephone conversations, long distance conversations, were being carried by that technology, a little bit of an improvement. And what they could do at this point is they did not have to build that cable. You don't have to actually create the cable. And that cable stuff is not all that cheap to make, you know, because it's heavy, it's got big thick plastic coating around it, insulation, it's got the, all this copper wire and so forth. So that cable costs a good deal, I don't know, tens of thousands of dollars a mile though. And so all of a sudden with the microwave towers, they didn't have to have that cable. So they saved the cost of the cable. And not only did they save the cost of the cable, they saved the cost of digging a trench and laying that cable down in there. And not only that, but they saved the cost of having to come along later when there's a problem with the telephone line and digging up, uh, you know, digging a hole and going down and finding that cable and finding some break in the line or whatever. They saved all that cost. They just put this tower right here and then shoot that signal for 30 miles and then build another tower and another one. And even though the towers are pretty expensive, a few million dollars, it was still much cheaper than laying the cable. And also they could carry a larger number of signals. Um, and this microwave towers, those came along in sort of a big way, I'm going to say in the early 1970s, early to mid 1970s. Okay, and then uh, along in about the late 1970s, early 1980s, they found some kind of little box that you can put on these things. And they put that little box on there and now each tower, each microwave tower, could carry three times as many telephone calls as before. And now, now, who knows what's next, but right now we're at the point where uh, I noticed here uh, a few years ago, Motorola created this thing called Iridium. It was a subsidiary. Motorola, of course, is a manufacturer. They manufacture cell phones and uh, computer processors and things like that. So anyway, they came along and created this thing called Iridium. What they did is they put 
what's the number, like 76 satellites in space. And then each person takes like a cell phone and they can go any place on Earth, I guess any place on Earth, I don't know about the South Pole, but most anywhere on Earth anyway, they take this thing that's like a cell phone, pull it out, push a few buttons in, and you know, you can be standing out in the middle of the desert and where there's no cities anywhere around, but there's a satellite overhead, and so your telephone call gets picked up by that satellite and it goes to wherever you want. Or you could be on an airplane, sort of flying overhead, you know, and over the ocean or whatever, pick up your cell phone, push a few buttons, and uh, call somebody. Now, what's happening here? What's happening is, you know, we still have the same natural resources that we always did, but we're finding new ways to use those natural resources. At first, we were using and turning those natural resources into things like telephone poles. That was our capital goods. But then after a while, we're turning it into cables, and then after a while, into microwave towers, uh, sending these, uh, uh, these telephone calls through the air 30, 40 miles, uh, you know, each time. And, and then here we are where we can talk anywhere on Earth. We're finding new ways to combine natural resources into new kinds of capital equipment. And what happens is each telephone employee is more productive than before. It takes fewer telephone employees to basically handle the business of providing a telephone call. Let's say in the old days, and I do not know these specific numbers, but let's just say in the old days that one employee, um, uh, maybe the telephone company would have one employee for every, and, and I'll just say 10,000 telephone calls, long distance telephone calls. And what happens is over the years, it takes fewer and fewer employees per 10,000 calls, or let's do it this way, maybe one employee, and, and I, you know, I'm telling you, I don't know these numbers, but I'm giving you something to illustrate. Maybe we got 50,000 telephone calls per employees uh, with the next technology. And maybe with the next one, we go up to one employee for 200,000 calls, and so forth. So, technology changes that means that our workers are more productive, we get more output from the same number of workers, and that means that this supply curve will shift to the right. Improvements in technology, gains in technology, a greater supply of goods and services than before. And you can go, I went through a couple of examples here, one with a telephone uh, as it's developed, and the other one with the dig in the ditches, either with a shovel or with a uh, a backhoe, but you can go through virtually any industry you want to and think about the technology, how that's changed and how we get more output from a given amount of input. How do we do that? We're working smarter. Technology is not something tangible you can touch. Technology is knowledge over how to use resources, how to take natural resources and combine them into capital, how to improve capital to use it with labor and so forth. But as our technology, as our knowledge grows, then we're able to supply a greater quantity of goods and services. Uh, I saw something on television recently, and it was talking about mining gold, and this will be my last technology example. But they were talking about mining gold and how that now the technology has improved for mining gold to where there's been as much gold mined from the earth in the last 50 years as had been mined all through history before that, the thousands of years um, before that. 50 years, we can find more gold now than we did in thousands of years before. What's changed about the technology? Nowadays, what they do is they'll find a place where there is gold, and they get the rock with this gold in it, and then they crush it up, and I mean just pound it down into a powder, and then they uh, inject some chemicals into that powder. It causes the gold to sort of melt and f basically separate itself from the rock. If you get this rock, though, with the gold in it, you can look at it and say, I don't see any gold. There's no gold there. And so they're just like little particles of gold in rock. It's something that all throughout history, if you had one of these rocks, you'd just say, man, I just cannot get the gold out of that. It's just little particles and hard rocks, and it's locked up there. And maybe we can get it out, but it just takes too long. It's not worthwhile. And all of a sudden now, well, as I say, with chemicals, we can get that gold to sort of melt. You have to crush the rock so the chemical can come into contact with the gold. But you crush that rock, the chemical touches the gold, the gold sort of melts and runs off this way, and the, the, um, the crushed stone runs off in the other direction, and we have that gold. And now we have lots and lots and lots of gold that's being produced relative to what's been done throughout history. So, more gold, 
increase in the supply of gold. But this is not happening in one industry or another industry. This is happening throughout our economy. So improvements in technology. This says change in technology. So if there's an improvement in technology, then that results in an increase in supply or a rightward shift in supply. Usually we don't have a, a worse technology or a deterioration but if we did then that would decrease the supply. You know you normally wouldn't expect technology to deteriorate to get worse because people can choose whatever technology they want right and so they if they say hey here's a worse idea they just say I'm not going to use it. And so we normally would not expect to see technology deteriorate in a market economy. And there is one way that it could, and that is we could just be ordered to use some other technology. Now, to give you an example, and, and I don't necessarily mean technology is worse here, but it's changed. Uh, if you go back to the 1950s and 1960s, you'd have, or for sure before that, you have big factories out here and they would be producing things like steel or whatever, and then they would create a lot of pollution and just put that pollution up in the air or dump it into the water. Just get rid of their pollution. And what would happen is they were very efficient at producing lots and lots of output because they didn't have to worry about keeping the, the air or the water clean. And so they could produce a lot of steel um, or a lot of whatever it is they're producing, textiles and so forth. And then along came the government in the 1970s, really, is when it started with the Environmental Protection Agency. And they're saying, we've got to protect the environment. So we're going to uh, pass laws that make a lot of this activity, this pollution activity, illegal or we're going to limit it. And what happened was, from the point of view of manufacturing steel, that would be a deterioration in, the, um, in technology. I don't mean to say that that's a worse thing or uh, going backwards, but I do mean to say that if, only, if your only interest is in producing steel, then what you'd say is technology is worse. We can't produce as much steel as we used to be able to. Now, we were producing something else that we had not been able to produce before, which was this clean air, or cleaner air at least. So, and that's what makes this not really a deterioration in a technology from a broader perspective. But from the narrow perspective of producing steel, technology got worse and the supply curve shifted to the left. We had less steel produced in the United States as a result of these EPA and other types of, laws, types of laws of that nature. As I say, I'm not trying to run that down or say we shouldn't have had that, uh, those laws. I'm only saying that that's the effect was to shift that supply curve to the left. And we could say the same thing about uh, other types of laws as well. Anyway, change of technology. Questions about this? An improvement in technology, we shift the curve to the right. We're getting more output from a given amount of resources. Or, if t technology gets worse, the curve shifts to the left. Any questions? Number, what's number three? Number three, a change in resource prices. Now, these resources we've talked about before, land, labor, capital and entrepreneurship those are the resources if you recall from about the first or second day of class we talked about productive resources I think we first talked about those when we talked about the production possibilities frontier each one of these resources has a price land well the price on land is rent Labor, the price of labor we call a wage. Capital, the price of that we call interest. And entrepreneurship, the price of that or the return to that we call profit. So these are the resources. And here are the resource prices. Wage, rent, interest, and profit. Anyway, what we want to know is what happens if these resource prices go up or down?
Let's start off with a supply curve S1. Let's say the wage rate, and I'll put myself a little superscript up here, wage equals, let's say wage is equal $8 an hour to begin with. And let's say that something happens to push wages up to, from $8 an hour to $10 an hour. Basically, let me draw the curve first and then we'll talk about it. The shift. Basically what happens is this curve shifts to the left or it shifts up. And we can sort of describe it in either way. Um, here's how we do this. Let's talk about a leftward shift in the supply curve. Here's what we would say. From the entrepreneur's point of view, from the business manager's point of view, what they were saying to begin with is, look, when the price is P1, let's, let's set a price for the, the product, good X, uh, of let's say $5. When the price of that product was $5, we were willing to sell, I don't know, 600 units. Let's leave the price of the product exactly the same, whatever this would be that we're selling, baseballs. Let's leave the price of the product exactly the same at $5, but then let's raise the wage from $8 to $10 an hour. Here's what the employer's thinking, the manager of the company. The manager of the company is thinking this. Look, when the price of the product was $5, and wages were $8 an hour, we were willing to sell 600 units. But now that wages have gone up, we're not making as much profit as we used to. We're paying an extra $2 an hour for workers. And since we're not making as much profit as we used to, we're not as excited about producing this product as we used to be. So this curve shifts to the left, let's say to 400 units. And the number of units is not important, or the amount of the wage change. But the point is, is that production is not as profitable as previously. And since it's not, let's supply fewer products. And another way of looking at that, that's where the curve shifts upward, is just it used to cost us a certain amount to produce the product. Now it costs us more. But the curve shifts upward to the left. If, resources, if resource prices go up, so let's sort of draw a little picture here. Increase in resource prices. result in a decrease in supply of the product. And make yourself a note so you don't get confused by what we're saying here. I'm not saying that higher resource prices result in a decreased supply of the resource. I'm talking about a decreased supply of the good produced with or by the resource. Okay, questions about this? It'd be the same thing if interest rates changed or if rents changed and so forth. As resource prices become higher, that decreases the supply of the product. If resources would go down, resource prices, I'm sorry, would go down, then that would shift the curve to the right. S3. Let's say here's the wage equals $7 an hour. And now I'm willing, the entrepreneur is willing, to offer more units for sale. Even though the price of the product's the same, now at the lower wage, the company, the employer says, wow, we're making bigger profits than we used to be. We're selling the product for $5 a unit as before, but now we're only paying $7 an hour, not eight. Our profits are greater. Hey, let's sell more units in order to make bigger profits. We're making more profit per unit. Let's sell more units. Questions about this? Sometimes we put, yeah, I'm not going to go there. Never mind. Uh, taxes is number four. Let's say changes in taxes. In taxes, or let's say subsidies, we'll include that.
Let's say that, to, uh, what will we have? A X, in this case, let's make that bushels of wheat. How about that? Just the kind of wheat that they turn into the bread you eat. And let's say when wheat is selling for um, uh, $4 a bushel, and so now X is bushels of wheat, when um, wheat is selling for $4 a bushel, maybe the typical wheat farmer produces, uh, I don't know, 10,000 bushels of wheat. Okay. Now, sometimes what will happen is the government will come along with a certain law that will either tax or subsidize. Taxes, I think everybody knows what that means. A tax basically is a little bit of a penalty that they impose on people for doing certain things. And they, it's not defined that way in the law. Taxes uh, in the law is just a unilateral transfer of dollars from you to the government. But it sort of, uh, they tax something. It's not just like a tax on uh, okay, give me your money. Uh, when, when we're taxed, we get taxed on our income, or we get taxed on something we produce, or we get taxed on something we sell, and so forth. So, in this particular case, what we'll be talking about is a tax on the production of good X. The government comes along and says, okay, you produced wheat, you're selling wheat, give me money. And so the tax is on X. And so let's take an example where the government comes along and basically says, we're going to impose a tax of 10 cents per bushel on wheat. 10 cents per bushel. Now this is pretty much the way that we saw with resource prices a moment ago. As soon as the government adds a tax of 10 cents per bushel, let me put a tax equals zero to begin with. Now all of a sudden the government says, we want 10 cents per bushel of wheat. Now here's the new supply curve. S2 tax equals 10 cents per bushel. And the idea, as I say, is just the same as it was a moment ago. Before there was a tax, the farmer thought, wow, $4 a bushel, the best thing I can do for me is to produce 10,000 bushels. But all of a sudden, now the farmer says, hmm, I get $4 a bushel from the customer, but then I have to hand over 10 cents a bushel to the government. I'm only left with $3.90 a bushel. And since I'm left with less, I'm not earning as much profit as before from wheat. And since I'm not earning as much profit uh, from growing this wheat, I'm going to produce less wheat. Produce less wheat and do what? Well, I can use my land and I can use my time and my tractor and the water and the fertilizer and so forth. I can use all that to grow something that doesn't get taxed. Let's say corn. This is a wheat tax. So what I'll do is I'll go into the corn business. And so I'm withdrawing some resources from producing wheat due to this tax and I'll produce corn instead some corn instead. And so here we have, maybe that farmer now is producing 9,500 bushels of wheat, you know, and takes a few acres out of production. So a tax, an increase in the tax, let, let me draw a little picture here, increase in the tax on a product results in a decrease in the supply of that product. Tax on X, supply of X goes down a leftward shift in the supply curve. Uh, I guess you can see pretty easily that all we have to do is talk about reversing the tax. Okay, we've got a 10 cents tax on wheat. Let's take that tax away. And if you take away the tax, it was 10 cents, and now you make it zero, then that curve will shift to the right. And so the arrows that I just drew here, we can reverse those. If the tax is reduced, the supply of that good goes up or increases. The curve shifts to the right. Questions about this? A subsidy is sort of the opposite from a tax. It's a reward. It's a reward for doing something. A subsidy on wheat production, for example, that would be, an, or the government might come along and say something like this. Hey, if you'll grow wheat, we'll give you 10 cents for every bushel you grow. Let's put that supply curve up there with that same uh, farmer growing that same 10,000 bushels of wheat. No subsidy. 
$4 a bushel, 10,000 bushels of wheat. And now the government comes along and says something like this. If you'll grow wheat, we'll give you 10 cents a bushel. This curve is going to shift to the right. We'll talk about why in just a second here. S2 subsidy equals 10 cents a bushel. The farmer says this, you know, I was growing 10,000 bushels of wheat when the price is $4 a bushel, and I was making the most possible profits I could. But now that there's an extra 10 cents a bushel return from growing wheat, I get $4 from the customer, and I get 10 cents from the government. Now the best thing I can do is to grow more wheat. Maybe now, uh, what, 10, uh, 11,000 bushels. It's more profitable to grow wheat than it used to be, so I'm going to grow more than I used to. Okay, so uh, an increase in the subsidy on X results in an increase in the supply of X. And of course, we can reverse the process, take the subsidy away, and then the curve shifts from S2 to S1. So if there's a smaller subsidy, there's a decrease in the supply of the good. Now, the government used to have quite a few subsidies on farm products. But a lot of those subsidies, it's been phasing out in recent years. Started back uh, in, what, 1996. Um, and the whole process uh, toward farms has been to phase out some of these subsidies. Uh, so we don't see as many of those as we used to. We do see subsidies of other things, however. Uh, sometimes those subsidies are hidden. For example, we have something called the Export-Import Bank, or the XM Bank. Export-Import. And what this is is a government agency that's encouraging exports. For example, let's say that um, an airline in the Philippines is thinking about buying airplanes. You know, they want to buy mm, jumbo jets, uh, Boeing 757s, or the Airbus, whatever the comparable unit is. And so then what will happen is Boeing might go to the Philippines, to this airline, and say, hey, if you buy our airplane, the United States government will lend you the money to buy this airplane through the Export-Import Bank, the XM Bank. It's not really a bank like where we'd put our deposits. It's a bank where it's like government making loans. So the Boeing might say to uh, this, this airline in the Philippines, if you'll buy our airplane, rather than buying that competing airplane that was produced over in Europe, then you can go to the Export-Import Bank and get a loan to buy the airplane. And maybe the airplane costs $40 million. Our government will lend you that $40 million, and you just pay back uh, a little bit at a time until it's paid off. And better still, they won't pay, make you pay a market interest rate. They'll lend you that money at a below market interest rate, something really attractive, 4% or whatever. Now, what we have at this point is we have the government, our government's going out and borrowing money and paying at a higher interest rate, 5 6 7%, and taking the money and lending it out to this airline in the Philippines so the airline in the Philippines can buy Boeing airplanes. And that is really, indirectly, it's sort of like the government giving Boeing money. Now, they don't do it directly. They give it to Boeing's customer. And then Boeing's customer gives it back to Boeing. But the point is that um, the United States is subsidizing the purchase of airplanes. So we still have these subsidies on the books. And the result is to shift the supply of those airplanes to the right, if airplanes is what we happen to be talking about as opposed to wheat. Okay. In the last 15, 20 years, what we've seen is that we're generally trying to phase these subsidies out. In the last 15 or 20 years, the government got into financial difficulties, sort of hard times, spent a lot of money it didn't have, had to go into heavy debt. And that being the case, now the government's trying to find a way to reduce its expenditures. And one way of doing that is to provide fewer subsidies, either to farmers or to Boeing or to anybody else. The Export-Import Bank, though, subsidizes more than just airplane purchases, so, and we're still in this business. There are other subsidies that you can think of that operate in different ways. Uh, students get subsidized, for example. Um, 
there's a lot of things subsidized. Small businesses get subsidized through the Small Business Administration and so forth. Okay, questions about this? What else do I have on my list? Anything? I think I've kind of finished that up. Um, so these are the things that will normally shift the supply curve either to the right or to the left. We already had a list the other day of things that will shift the demand curve to the right or to the left. And so you need to be familiar with both lists and know, for example, that if there's an improvement in technology, improvement in technology, that there's an increase in the supply. You should be able to go through this list and in each case say, if there's an increase or if there's a decrease in whatever this variable is, how does that affect the supply curve? Shift it to the right, shift it to the left. Okay. Okay. Now let's work with the supply and demand curves a little bit. All we want to do is just become familiar with the supply and demand curves and what happens if the supply or demand curve shifts. So S1, D1, Q1, P1. So this is a nice beginning point. What we want to do is show the impact of, let's say, number one, an increase in demand. If there's an increase in demand, the demand curve shifts to the right. And what we see is the equilibrium price has gone up to P2 and the equilibrium quantity has gone up to Q2. We're looking at the equilibriums. The price and quantity have both gone up. So let's sort of keep a log over here. If there's an increase in the price, then what we observe is an increase in the... That's not right. If there's an increase... If there's an increase in demand, sorry, then we'll see an increase in the equilibrium price and an increase in the equilibrium quantity. Let's draw another graph. It'll look exactly the same in our beginning point. We'll have a price of P1 and a quantity of Q1. And now what we'll do is we'll shift the demand curve to the left, to D2. What we observe is a new equilibrium price and quantity. The equilibrium price is now lower, and the equilibrium quantity is now lower. So again, if we just kind of keep track here, decrease in demand, we get a lower price, and a lower quantity. These are equilibriums. Change in equilibrium price and quantity. Questions about this? Pretty straightforward. Let's do the same thing with supply now. We start off with our equilibrium point. Now we'll just increase the supply, shift the curve to the right, S2. We see the new equilibrium price is now P2, and the new equilibrium quantity is Q2. So whenever we come over to record this, what we write down is increase in supply results in a lower price and a larger quantity. And the fourth case, and the final case really, We start off with the original equilibrium. We're going to decrease the supply, shift the curve to the left, S2. And what we observe is the equilibrium price is now higher and the equilibrium quantity is now lower, Q2. So decrease in supply. What do we get? Increase in price and a decrease in quantity. Now, I'm telling you, 
<coughs> not just telling you, I'm more or less promising you, that I'm going to ask you questions on the test or that you need to be real familiar with this. And you can for sure draw the graph and sort of work your way through it slowly and so forth. But the more familiar you are with this, the easier it'll be, the quicker it'll be, and you'll have time for other types of questions. But you need to for sure be familiar with this. Now, I may say something like this on the exam. If the demand for the product goes up, the price will do what? The quantity will do what? Up or down? And so then we start off here and then work our way across. But it may be that I would tell you something like this on the test. Oh, I observe that the quantity traded in the marketplace has gone down and while the price has gone up. Quantity down, price up. What would have caused that? Did I say price down, quantity up? What would have caused that? Well, there's only one place where you see the price is going down and the quantity is going up. And so there's only thing, one thing that would have caused that. That's a greater supply. So I'm saying I may start off here and say, suppose demand or supply shifts, what's the effect? But I may also tell you the effect and ask you what was the cause. Now, the really exciting cases, I shouldn't say exciting because you're not as excited by this as I am, but the exciting cases for me, at least, are the combinations. And that's why I put all these up here, because we want to go to a combination. Suppose I say something like this happens. There's an increase in demand and a decrease in the supply of the product. What if those two things happen? Not just one or the other, because you know out there in the real world, there's no law that says, oh, you've got to have a demand curve shift or a supply curve, but not both of them at once. What if the demand curve increases, shifts to the right, and the supply curve decreases, shifts to the left? Then what happens? And let's come over here and sort of mm, trace this out. There's an increase in price and an increase in quantity caused by the shift in demand. The shift in supply, what we see, a decrease in supply, we have a higher price and a smaller quantity. So if this occurs, increase in demand, decrease in supply, here's what I see. I see a price increase. I see a price increase. I think there's going to be a price increase. But what about quantity? The greater demand, that means that we're going to trade more in the marketplace. So a greater quantity will trade. But the fact there's a decrease in supply means that there's going to be a smaller quantity offered for sale. So yeah, people want to buy more, but other people want to sell less. And so there's an increase in quantity traded and a decrease in quantity. And which one of those is going to determine the outcome? And the answer is, we don't know from this information. We just don't know. We say that, that what happens to quantity, that's indeterminate. We're just not sure, unless somebody, and that would be me since I make up the test, but if somebody were to say something to you like this, there's a big increase in demand and there's a small decrease in supply. If they tell you something like that, they or me, big increase in demand, oh, this quantity increase is big, Small decrease in supply, the decrease in quantity is small. So I guess that what happens to demand, that must be sort of the, the driving force here. I think quantity will go up. So a test question or events in the real world, those could inform you about whether demand or supply is shifting by more. But the point is, is that you're going to have something that's indeterminate. And, and by the way, that is the quick answer to this. Every single time that there's two curves shifting, Every time, not sometimes, every time that both curves shift, there's something that's indeterminate. And in this particular case, it was quantity. And then we either have to say, I don't know what will happen to quantity, or if we have the information to know that it was the demand that shifted more than supply, or supply that shifted more than demand, then we can come back and get rid of that indeterminacy by saying, oh, here's the one that wins out in terms of its magnitude, its size. Let's do another one of these. Let's suppose, for example, that there's a decrease in demand and a uh, decrease in supply. The decrease in demand, that pushes down the price. Lower demand, you can't sell it for as much. And a decrease in demand means that less will be traded also in the marketplace. People don't want to buy as much as before. The decrease in supply says price will go up. There's not so much available, so now its price gets bid up but the decrease in supply means less is offered for sale. Well, there's no indeterminacy with respect to quantity. Both the decrease in demand and the decrease in, buy, in supply are both pushing down the quantity traded. 
but the decrease in demand is causing price to fall, and the decrease in supply is causing price to rise. Now it's price that's indeterminate. I don't know if price is going up or down unless somebody would tell me which of these two forces is stronger. If somebody said, that's a big decrease in supply, big, this is a small decrease in demand, then what I say is, oh, the indeterminacy has been decided. This is a big change in supply. It's a small change in demand. And so I think it's the supply that's going to de determine the price change. That's going to be a price increase. Now, when I was a student, on test days, I'd be sitting there taking a test, and I'd get my fingers out and sort of shift those around, increase in demand, increase in supply, that sort of thing. Uh, whatever works for you, what I would suggest is that you spend some time just sort of drawing these little graphs. You don't have to go to so much effort to label all the axes and things like that, but work these through. And, and these are the simple cases here where we only have one curve shifting, but you for sure ought to be able to do these maybe in your sleep, maybe not quite in your sleep. Um, but you for sure ought to be able to do these easily. And these over here that are more complex, where you're shifting two curves, you need to be familiar with that. Questions about this? Yes, sir. Which, um, if you're not told what's, what changes bigger yes. and smaller, um, how do you um, write the quantity? Well, what you would have is just this conflicting information. And in the, in the light of that conflicting information, you just say, I don't know. That's in your own mind. And then on a test, you would look for the answer where you get to say quantity is indeterminate. And it'll be a multiple choice kind of a deal. So I'll give you various choices, and then you'll decide which one you want to pick. Okay? There's, every single time there's two curves shifting, though, something's indeterminate. Is the test multiple choice? Yes, it is. How many questions? Don't know. Haven't made it up. How many do you think it ought to have? Maybe 50, 60? Let me sort of finish up for today, and then we'll pick up at this point next time. And remind you that if the price changes and goes up from P1 to P2, that we get a smaller quantity demanded, Q2. But this is a change in quantity demanded. A change in quantity demanded is caused by a change in price. And anything else that affects consumption shifts that curve from one point to another. Be sure that you don't forget about distinguishing between a change in demand and a change in quantity demanded. And that is what I will start talking about next time. So long.